we're continuing a series we kicked off last uh, Sunday. Um, and I'm excited to share with you. Um, Paul was going to be sharing with you guys this morning, and he'll get a chance to later on in the summer, but I uh, found out when I was coming down that, that he was down in Roseburg, and so um, we put this together. And, uh, but I'm excited to be sharing uh, with you. Uh, we're in our series on, in the book of Proverbs called um, Hashtag Wisdom. And if you don't know what hashtags are, I'm sure you do by this point because they're everywhere, all over the place, all over uh, social media. Some of you guys still remember it as a pound sign on the old school phone. Uh, but there's these things, if you don't know, they're called hashtags. And, and all they are is, is a way on social media platforms to categorize things. So it's easier to find them. Uh, so when somebody puts the little pound sign and then puts uh, uh, something after it, uh, you've seen it on your social media feeds, it makes it bold. And if you click on it, then you, it, you see all the posts related to what the hashtag is. So basically, it's a way of just categorizing pictures, categorizing posts. Uh, that, that make it more easily accessible to find um, what you're looking for. Uh, it's just a categorizing system, uh, and so it makes topics available for, for you to find easily. And so when it comes to Proverbs, um, Solomon, he, he was uh, the second wisest man to ever live, walk on the face of this earth. Uh, Jesus was the wisest, so basically Solomon was the wisest, if his you know wisest guy, not named God, uh, to walk the face of the earth. And he wrote these proverbs. And if you've ever read the book of Proverbs. Um, uh, and I hope you have, and I hope you're reading through it as we walk through this series this summer. Um, they're just short statements. And it seems like Solomon's got massive case of ADD, right? Because it's just like, boom, 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 like just all over the map. And, and you're like, I don't sense any theme in this whatsoever. But, but the thing is, is that he kind of writes them like, well, kind of like tweets, um, or Facebook posts, for those of you who don't know what tweets are. They're like short little statements, um, and you could put on them after every single one of them. You could, you, could, you could post it, and then you could say, hashtag wisdom, right? And if you did that, you would, and clicked on those hashtags, they would be all over um, incredible statements that if you started living your life by them, you would grow in wisdom, and your life would look uh, so much different and so much better. Um, and, and so as we walk through these, we're going to take proverbs from all over the place that have to do with certain topics, and we're going to bring them all together because that's what um, Solomon writes all over, and so we're going to kind of categorize them. Um, last week, we talked about getting direction and understanding um, that our intentions uh, and our directions sometimes are two totally different things. And how sometimes we like, to, we like to judge everybody else based on their intentions, but we like, to, uh, or we like to judge everybody based on their actual direction, but we always judge ourselves based on our intentions. And how we get ourselves in trouble because um, we go with our intentions rather than the direction. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. We kicked off the series. And today we're going to talk about wise friendships. And it's actually really cool that our middle schoolers hung in here uh, today. It was a kind of a God thing because... Um, I'm excited for you guys to hear about what God's word says about friendships and who you choose as friends. And I'm excited for, for you guys to hear about it because sometimes you're like, well, this would be, work really good as a youth lesson, um, but why are you talking about this in big kids' church, Joel? Um, and because you big kids need to understand what God says about friendships because we interact with people and God has a lot to say about uh, friendships. I'd like to start off with several quotes, though, before we jump in. I love this. C.S. Lewis said this, friendship is born at the moment when, when one person says to another, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. I love that. Someone else said, a friend is someone who thinks you're a good egg even though you're a little cracked. <laughs> Somebody said, a friend is one who multiplies joys and divides grief. A friend is one who understands our silence. And finally, a friend is one who comes in when the whole world is going out. I love those quotes. Um, 
And I hope that as I was reading them, you had a name of somebody in your life that's that friend for you. But if you don't, or um, I hope that we learn together what friendships look like, because friendships are really essential for life. Um, friendship is essential for life because God designed us that way. We were designed to live not isolated, not off by ourselves. We were designed to live in community with one another, to be around people and then to invite people into our lives. God intended us for, for us not to just... Um, not to just have any friends, but be intentional about our friendships and pour into them and have friendships and friends that pour into to us. It's so important. Um, and if you're married in here, I want you to understand too that, that it's important to have friends outside of just your spouse. Sometimes when we get married, and, and I, I kind of thought this when I was first married, it was like, you know what, I just, all I need is my wife, and we're just, we're good, and we have uh, just beautiful community with one another, and, but, but I found out real quick that it was so important that I keep and maintain friendships with other guys. And so guys, you need, God designed you to have friendships with other men who challenge you and pull you out and, and that you can be men with and, and, and that you understand one another. And women, you need friendships outside of your spouse that, that's another uh, woman and ladies that, that can pull you along and encourage you and understand your heart and understand your feelings and, and, and that you can walk along life and, and walk alongside life with. God designed men to need other men and ladies to need other ladies to, to have community with and walk through life together with. Um, when we first got married, um, we had, before we got married, we had this you know, huge group of friends that we always were hanging out with and um, great people and uh, we were used to being around a whole lot of people and then uh, we got married and we went out on our honeymoon for 10 days um, and it was like the most incredible thing. We had the most incredible time in Hawaii and, and uh, just enjoying getting to know one another and spending every moment together and it was like the best 10 days ever and, and we got back and life kind of, we went on, uh, we went to camp and, and, but we spent a lot of time together there and we were just, it was like a month in and we had just spent a whole bunch of time together, which was awesome because we were getting to know one another. But there, I remember there was a point at which we were sitting there and, and it had been a long, long time, over a month since we had got to hang out with our friends and we just kind of sitting there and we're like, boy, we need some community. And I remember telling Beth, I was like, we need, I need a night where I can just go out and hang out with the boys and enjoy life together with them. And you need a night where you just get to go out and hang out with your friends, your, your girls, and just, and, and just get reconnected with them because we missed them. And there wasn't anything wrong with what was going on in our marriage. Everything was the best. It was so wonderful. But we just had this longing in our hearts to reconnect with our friends because God designed it that way. So I want to talk today about how we build wise friendships, not just any old friendships, not just, um, you know, hey, I know you, you know me, we're, we're friends now, but how do we build wise friendships? And there's four principles I want to talk about in the book of Proverbs today, and the first one you can write this in is um, how we build wise friendships. First, choose your friends. This might seem a little bit obvious, choose your friends. Um, but be selective in your friendships. Solomon says it this way. The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Choose your friends carefully. The righteous choose their friends carefully because the wicked leads away. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians, that do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. We know this. We have even some modern day parables that we've probably heard from our parents or that our parents have said to us. Or um, if, if you're a parent, you might have said this like, um, you'll never turn out right doing wrong, right? Or uh, you're known by the company you keep, right? Choose your friends or they will choose you, right? We have these sayings that you've probably heard growing up. Um, 
And your, and your parents may have said things like that or emphasized uh, who you hang out with. But the funny thing is, is that now we just, sometimes as adults, we just assume that that was just meant for kids. Like that was just something we say to our kids, but then we, because we're somehow mature or somehow older, that we can just hang out with whoever and that this, this verse doesn't apply to us anymore. That we can just hang out with whoever or we can choose whoever we want to hang out with and, and that, that this verse doesn't apply. But, but it still does. Bad company corrects good character. I, I want you to be intentional about the friends you choose. Make deliberate decisions. Um, don't simply let just work association or, or the, you know, because your kids play sports together or, or, or for, your, for the kids in here, just because you go to school with them um, and they're popular and, and, and everybody likes them, um, don't, don't let that be the only thing that uh, makes you be friends with them. Now, I'm not talking about uh, not being friendly with everybody. Right? Or choose, like, or just being, you know, associating with other people. It's good that we are around and being friendly and with, with people who are unbelievers or people far off from God because we have an opportunity to influence them. But I'm talking about those people that you allow to, to have a place in your heart where, it's, where they speak into your life. Those friendships that, that shape the way we make decisions. We needed to choose deliberately those people in our lives. So, how should we choose your friends? Um, Four words, uh, eternity, affinity, chemistry, and loyalty. You can write this in, first of all, eternity. Um, choose friends who are going where you're going. Choose friends who are going where you're going. Your closest friends, your best friends, I believe should be people who are going to spend eternity with you, with Jesus. Those people in your life that you share and, and invite into the most uh, intimate place, the, the, the friendships, the, the, the closest in your life, those, are, those should be people who love Jesus, who follow Jesus. Sometimes in life, it's like, yeah, I don't, you know, I got this buddy, like, boy, he doesn't really care much about Jesus, but we play darts together, you know? What? Like, you, you can... You connect over darts? And that's who your best friend is? They don't care about Jesus at all, but you're, you know, you go play pool together every once in a while, or you just hang out every once like, that seems silly, and I'm not saying that, that we can't hang out with other people and play darts and, and hang out with, no, but, but those people that are the closest, that we invite into the most, um, the most intimate space of friendship with one another. Well, they should be people who are pushing you and drawing you towards Jesus. The one, like we talked about last Sunday, those who are, who are pushing you and helping you stay on the right path and chasing after Jesus, hard after Jesus. They're the people who are, are the ones who are, um, who are encouraging you to keep going in your faith. And those need to be people who are going where you're going, who push you. Now, I'm, again, please don't hear me on this, uh, hear me wrong on this. I'm not telling you to sever every relationship that doesn't, uh, that, that of people who aren't going to heaven or who aren't Christians. I don't believe that at all. In fact, I think the opposite. We should be having friendship, and we should be having community, and we should be going out and reaching lost people for Jesus. We, I think you understand. We've been talking about that a lot over the last uh, month or so. Jason preached a great message about that uh, just about three weeks ago about how we do need to have those relationships with others. So don't hear me. Don't, don't think I'm saying sever those relationships, but I'm talking about the, the, the closest friends you have. They should be people who are drawing you closer to the heart of God and keeping you, helping keep you on the path leading to God. I love that we were up at camp, and one of my good friends, John, uh, was, was teaching all week at camp, and he was talking about the idea of being together, and as, as the body of Christ, as, as people who follow Jesus, how we're, how we're better together, and, and how we need to do life together. And I love a statement he made, that he said, he said this about our, our um, connection with those who are other Christians who are in Christ. He said this, you have more in common with a brother or sister in Christ who lives in Afghanistan than you do with somebody who you work with who doesn't know Jesus. Amen. And that's uh, it's just incredible to think about, that when you belong to the kingdom of God, you have more in common with a brother or sister in Asia or in Europe or in Afghanistan or wherever across the world, you have more in common with them 
than you do with anybody that you call a friend who doesn't belong to Jesus because you're going where they're going and you are headed on the same path together. I think it's important that we realize that. Amos, the prophet Amos says it this way, can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? I think we understand how that works in a, in a physical sense, right? But sometimes there's a disconnect there when it comes to friendships. The Apostle Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can, un, how can righteousness be partnered with wickedness? How can light, uh, light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be partnered with an unbeliever? And what Paul's talking here about is this, these, these deep um, relationships, not just any relationship, but the deep relationships, um, work partnerships, those who you spend the most time with, marriages. He's saying, listen, they need to be people who love Jesus and walk with Jesus. Reach out, share Jesus, yes, but the, let your deepest friendships be the, from fellow believers. And if you're like, Joel, I just, I don't have any of those. You know, like, my best friends are, are people I do go hang out with. They are the guys that I went to college with and just, we did everything together, and, but they don't know Jesus. Um, a couple of real practical things. One, help them know Jesus. <laughs> like, get in with them, be an example, be a light, be, begin to disciple them. Begin to walk with them towards Jesus so that they are going where you're going. Or number two, look around here, find somebody else, invite them out to coffee, get to know them because there's some really, really cool people here. Um, there's some really, really neat people here who chase after Jesus and you guys could run together to get to know people. Second, affinity. Uh, this one's really simple. Choose friends who are doing what you're doing. Choose friends who enjoy doing the same things you enjoy doing. This, one, this one's kind of just common sense, right? Um, and we typically team up with people who we enjoy doing stuff with, right? But then there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with enjoying being together with those who have common interests. Um, seems like the people that I end up hanging out with most, my closest friends, we connect on one of three things. We connect on sports, we connect on music, or we connect in ministry, on ministry things. Because that's what I enjoy doing. I enjoy sports, and so watching sports, playing sports, doing sports together, I, I connect with people who can... Who, who play sports or love sports. I connect with people who, who love music because I love music. Um, and, and I love playing music with people. And then some of, most of my best friends in, are people who we do ministry together. And they may be off, and that was what's so cool about last week. I got to hang out with John and, and some other of my friends who do ministry who I don't get to see very often. Um, but some of my most of my best friends are, are guys who are in ministry and, and fighting for the kingdom of God. And, and so we connect because it, we do the same things. Guys, look for people who you enjoy living life with, enjoy doing the same things with and connect. I'm sure most of you are like, yeah, that one's pretty easy. I got that one, Joel. Um, because we tend to just group up with those people. But but, but enjoy that. Enjoy doing what you're doing with your friends. Friend, God created people with interests so that you could enjoy their company and he put, put the hobbies that you have in your life because, man, you just, so you can connect with people and live in community. Third thing is chemistry. Choose friends who are feeling what you're feeling. Um, that's like, that we just understand chemistry. That's way it, when it just, it clicks. You know, you don't know, you have no clue why, but you just enjoy being together. You just have this chemistry, you just click together, you enjoy life together. One of my best friends um, to this day, we connected, I was in the fourth grade, he was in the fifth grade, we met up at the camp I was at just last week, um, and we met on the basketball court, fourth and fifth grade, um, and uh, I don't, I, to this day, I don't remember any of the conversations we have. It probably wasn't anything profound. <laughs> it was probably like, hey, you like, yeah, hey, oh, okay, <laughs> let's be friends. Um, that's probably the relationship, how it started. Uh, but he's one of my best friends today, and now we do ministry together. He, Tim, he does ministry up in, in Deer Park, and just one of my best friends. But it just, it just clicked. And we have just this bond 
that's, that's tight like brothers. Uh, another friend, I, I got to see him yesterday at the car- carnival. It was really cool. He showed up with his family, Getty. Um, and uh, we met when I was probably in seventh or eighth grade. And uh, we had, we, I'd started playing sports. Now, Getty, at that time, he was in like the, he was like in the eighth grade. Um, he was about six foot one, just this huge guy and the long hair and a ponytail. I was maybe 90 pounds with a buzz cut. And uh, we had nothing in common, like as far as what we look like. Uh, it was the most unlikely pair ever. But something just clicked, and we, had, we just had some fun times together. We grew, you know, we just played together. We played sports together. We hung out together. I don't even know what clicked, but it clicked, and we had chemistry, and it was just a, a great time in high school and, and in middle school with Getty. Uh, and to this day, I hadn't seen him in almost, almost a year, and he showed up to our carnival, and it's like, ah, oh, brother, it's good to see you. It's good to have, you know, there's just that chemistry there. So choose friends that, who are feeling what you're feeling. And then the third thing is loyalty. Choose friends that are standing for what you're standing for. Man, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing worse than when you're going through a, a hard time, a rough patch, and looking over and seeing your friends look in the other direction. Or when you need somebody to have your back when they're not there to have your back. Boy, that's devastating, isn't it? I'm sure you can all think of moments in life where that's happened to you. But on the flip side, how encouraging it is when you're going through a rough time and there's a friend there that's loyal and that he's right on your back and he's walking through life. He's there with you and they walk through life with you. Paul writes this to Timothy. At my first answer, no man stood with me but all men forsook me, and I pray God, uh, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Paul was in a rough patch in ministry. And how sad, this is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. The great apostle Paul, who's just out there serving the kingdom of God, and he wrote to T- Timothy, he says, listen, I, I was going through a rough patch, and all men forsook me. I had nobody that was standing behind me. We need friends who are, who are loyal to us, who will stand up for us, who are fired up about the same things we're fired up about. Man, that made all the difference as we were walking through and grieving when, when my dad passed away. Your guys' prayers were felt by our family. And we knew you guys had our backs because you guys were praying for us. And I had friend after friend who would just, I couldn't answer all the texts I was getting from my friends in ministry and my friends in life because, and they were just pouring out love and support and loyalty. Find friends, friends, find friends that will do that for you and be loyal. So the first thing we learn about friendship from the book of Proverbs is choose your friends. Secondly, write this in, love your friends. Love your friends. Proverbs 17, 17 says it this way. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Now, as we read this, yeah, all you ladies are like, oh, yeah, loving, loving each other, that's great. And dudes, are, all those guys are like, love your, what? Come on, man, that's not, that's not manly. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, like, you know, support them and all, but love? Like, come on. Um, that's, not, that's not what we're about. But, but we've got to think about what is love, right? What, is, what does the Bible say about love? Um, we hear 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. You guys all probably have heard it before. If you've been to any wedding, any time you've heard 1 Corinthians 13, it's been dubbed as the, the marriage chapter, like it's read at every wedding. But, but when Paul was writing this initially, he was not writing to a wedding. He was not penning this for somebody's marriage in Corinth. He was writing this to a church full of men and women who were a bit divided and who he, said, he was encouraging them to get together and to love one another and to show their love for one another. He was writing to men and women about how to be loving in the church. 
and how God wants us as friends and as brothers and sisters to love one another. And he starts out this way, if I speak in tongues of men or angels, but, have not, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I might boast, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Now, I want you to, as I read this next section, I want you to grade your friendships. Love is patient. Does this define your relationship, your friendships? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Does that kind of love define your friendships? Does that kind of love define the friendship you have in your marriage? Does that love define the friendships you have with your other brothers and sisters? Does that love define the friendships you have at work? The really cool thing is that right before Paul jumps into this in the end of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, he says, now here is a more excellent way. And then he starts talking about love. So here's a question. Why is love the more excellent way? Why is loving one another like this the more excellent way? I mean, there's a lot of ways we can relate to people, right? We can tolerate people, which is what we tend to do most of the time, right? We could hate people, which I wouldn't advise that because Jesus doesn't advise that. We can ignore people completely. We can put up with people. We can kind of have a neutral relationship with people where it's just kind of like, yeah, I mean, they exist as a human. I acknowledge that. But the more excellent way is to love people. I think that's what we saw Jesus do consistently throughout his time on earth, right? And as people who are, who are made in God's image and who are, who are trying to be like Jesus, if we're trying to shoot for that goal, we must love people like Jesus loved people because it's the most excellent way. And I think if we're honest, there is something that comes alive inside of us. Yes, even us guys. There's something that comes alive inside of us. Although, you know, I know you'd never admit it, but there is something that comes alive when we feel loved by somebody. When we feel like somebody's got our back and that they're patient with us and they're kind with us. When we know that they're not going to keep records of wrongs, where they're not going to delight when we fail. They're going to rejoice when truth happens, where they're going to hope for us. Man, something sparks inside of us, and we're like, I would love friends that do that for me. Let me ask you this. Are you a friend that does that for others? Are you loving your friends? And are you choosing friends that love you like that? Third thing you can write in this, not only... Choose your friends and love your friends, but challenge your friends. Challenge your friends. Proverbs 27, 6 says it this way. Faithful are the wounds from a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. That's kind of an interesting proverb, isn't it? It seems a little backwards to us, right? Um, we would say, well, aren't... You know, like the, the kisses of a friend, those would be the, that would be the good things and the wounds would be from an enemy, but, but he switches it here. I, I think we all know this. We know people who are, uh, who kiss up to other people, don't we? Like who are total suck-ups. Like you, you, all these students are like, oh yeah, that's my sister or my brother. <laughs> Always, you know, sucking up to mom and dad, right? Uh, oh, we've got to be the good kid. Um, but we know there's people at work too, right? The ones that are always kissing up to the boss, always trying to... We, we understand that. 
And we know that those people are full of it, don't we? We do. They're, they're constantly living this. That we're like, that person is just, they're just full of it. And he says, the kisses, so the people who suck up to us, even though they're our enemies, we know they're deceitful. He said, better are. Better than that is a friend who will speak truth into your life, even when you don't want to hear it. Even when it hurts a little bit. Even when it doesn't necessarily feel good at the moment. He said, it's better. It's better to have friends like this. It is better for you to have friends who are willing to risk their friendship with you to tell you the truth so that you can grow to be more like Jesus than those who are like, no, everything's fine. You're great. I don't, don't worry about that. It's, I mean, it's just a little sin in your life. Don't worry about it. Like, everybody sins. Friends, those are kisses from an enemy. Real friends, real friends are the ones who will cut through with truth in love and say, I love you too much to continue to allow you to ruin your life with this sin. And I'm willing to risk our friendship to let you know that I love you and I don't want to see you struggle with this. Boy, that may hurt for a moment, but that's a real friend. That's someone you can trust. That's someone who you know has your back. We need to be friends like that, and we need, to, we need to create an atmosphere in our friendships where your friends feel comfortable coming to you and challenging you. And you know how you do that? Welcome that challenge. If you're constantly defensive, and every time somebody brings something, you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, back off, man. I'm just doing me. Like, this is who I am, all right? Don't try to change me. If you, if you have that pr pride in your life, People will stop challenging you. And chances are, friends, if you don't have friends that are challenging you, you should probably examine your heart a little bit because you have probably made an environment around you where you, people aren't comfortable with challenging you anymore. And you need to do the work of going out to your friends and inviting them to challenge your life because you want friends like that. And I will just give you this practical. If you are going to challenge one of your friends, make sure you do it in a loving way. Make sure they know you have their back and that you love them. And that's the whole reason why you're going to come up, that why you're going to challenge them is because you love them. Don't just go blast them. But go in a loving way. Put your arm around them and say, I love you so much, but I see something in your life that's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt your family. It's going to hurt your kids. It's going to hurt your wife. And I can't let you do it because I love you. Boy, that's a friendship right there. Proverbs, notice what else um, Proverbs says. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. We've heard this one before, right? And we understand this. Um, we understand this principle when it comes to sharpening knives or sharpening tools. What do you have to use? You have to use something that's hard so that you can, and scrapes against it and it, it pulls off. Now, I, I understand that iron has no feelings or no nerve endings, um, but if iron had nerve endings and it had feelings, when it's being scraped across other iron or across the sharpening stone, I can guarantee that it didn't, it's, it's not like, oh, this feels great, right? No, if it had feelings, I'm sure it's like, ah, this hurts. I don't like this. As shavings are coming off of it, you're like, the iron can't, it can't feel that great. And sometimes that's how it feels because there's, when iron comes across iron, there's friction that happens and the heat develops. But it's also getting sharper and more useful and better. And friends, sometimes when we're getting challenged by our friends, it's not fun. And sometimes it's friction and sometimes it hurts and sometimes it feels like there's parts of our lives that are getting shaved off but we're getting sharper, we're getting more effective, and we're getting more useful. That's what I love about my friend Sean, um, who I talk to every couple weeks, because he just challenges me. Um, 
The last two, uh, a couple weeks ago when I was um, talking to him, he's, he's, we were talking through life and just doing our, our thing, and then he's like, hey, I've been asking all my guys that I, I, ch- or I mentor, that I've been asking them this question, um, what's, one, what's one way that, that Satan's been attacking you and tempting you lately? Boy, that's not a fun question to answer, friends. Especially, and that's not a fun question to be truthful about when you answer. But I know Sean loves me, and I know that he wants better to me, and I know that he wants to sharpen me and make me more useful. And so I love him for that. I love that he asks that question to me. And that I can be honest, knowing that he's going to challenge me and love me enough to help push me. We must be willing to challenge our friends, and we must be able to, to take being challenged from our friends and not become defensive about it. The fourth thing you can write this in, enjoy your friends. Enjoy them. God put us here on earth to live in community with one another and to enjoy that community. Um, Proverbs 27 verse 9 says it this way. The heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. He's saying just, man, perfume and and incense were expensive, valuable things back then. And so Solomon is saying, listen, the heartfelt counsel of a friend is so valuable that we should just enjoy that. Boy, especially if you have friends in your life that like we've been talking about here this morning, Boy, I have, I have, I, I'm so blessed to have s- multiple friends like we've been talking about here this morning. And it's just so sweet to be able to enjoy them, to enjoy that friendship with them. I, I want you to think for a moment, just think, it, close your eyes and just think for a moment, if you had a free day, <laughs> that seems silly to some of us, if you had a free day to spend with a friend and just enjoy that day and do anything with that person, just doing exactly what you would do, what would you do with that person? What, would, what were some of the things you'd do? It was so sweet um, on, on Father's Day. Beth and I, having both lost our dads this, um, recently, it was kind of a hard day for us, and we were feeling it, and um, we were pretty emotional, and we went up and uh, visited my dad's graveside, and we, were, we took the kids with us and um, had some sweet moments there. But we were going in the car back, and um, Callie, who's just our sweet angel, she said, she said, Daddy, if, if you had a week to do anything you wanted with grandpa, what would you do? And so we just had this conversation. I kind of turned it back to her and the kids, and our kids just started coming up with these grand plans of what they would do if they had a week to spend with grandpa. And it got me kind of thinking about this exercise where it's kind of fun to just stop and think if we had a day or if we had a week to just spend with the people who are our best friends, those people who draw us closer to Jesus and who, who, who are loyal to us and, and who love doing the things we do and who we enjoy, who challenge us, what would you do? And friends, I just, I just want to challenge you. Go carve out time to do that. Lay aside some of the busy work to go enjoy life with your friends and your loved ones and your family because you don't know how long you're going to have with them. And if it means rearranging life and putting some of those things that you think are so important, and trust me, I'm preaching to myself at this moment. If it means rearranging those things that you can go and enjoy your friends and the people you love, who God puts you here to do life with and live in community with, do it. Do it. Because he made you for that. Proverbs 11 says it this way. 
The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. I love this verse. It hits me every time whenever I read it because it challenges me. Am I refreshing to other people or do I drag them down? In my friendships, am I a joy to be around or not? And that challenges me. Do I spark joy in other people's lives? I, do I, by being around me, do I refresh other people? Or are they like, oh, here comes Joel. <laughs> All right, endure, endure, endure. Um, <laughs> right? Like, oh boy, here he comes. Avoid eye contact. Okay, let's look away. Let's, let's, let, maybe he won't stay if I come. Am I that kind of person? Or am I the kind of person who brings life to people, who refreshes people? I love this proverb. The gen those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Friends, when you are that spark of refreshment to others, you are a joy to be around and you feel refreshed. And I'm not talking about if you're an extrovert or an introvert, okay? I'm an introvert. But that doesn't give me an excuse to be, not be refreshing to other people. And when I am around my friends, to bring life to them and refreshing to them. Man, true, authentic friendships are a gift from God. There's so much more than just friending somebody on Facebook and stalking them then. <laughs> Friendship, man, I think social media has, we have never been more connected as a society and never been so shallow in our friendships. We need to be a people who, are, who, who love deeply our friends, chase after them, refresh them, move towards them, challenge them, encourage them, deepen our friendships. Let's not settle for the shallowness of Facebook friendships. Let's go deep with our friendships because that's wisdom. That's wisdom. And it's worth any extra amount of time and energy you have to put in. There's one more scripture I want to conclude as we're wrapping this up. And Proverbs says, 18 says this way, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And Solomon didn't, maybe didn't know this when he wrote it, but now for 2,000 plus years, we know this person to be Jesus, Right? That when we belong to Jesus, we have a friend who does stick closer than a brother. He's always with us. He is the one who will walk through life in every moment with us, no matter where you're at. And I know that many of you, many of you are struggling with, with losing people you love or on the, the cusp of that or battling with health things. And you just need to understand and be encouraged this morning. You have a friend who sticks closer than a brother and he will walk through every moment of life with you. He is not an unreliable friend. He is the most reliable friend and his name is Jesus. And friends, if you're in here and you don't know who Jesus is and you don't know and you have never made Jesus the Lord of life, you haven't invited him in to be your friend, you're gonna want a friend in Jesus. Because he is that friend that will walk through life with you and never leave you or forsake you. Whether or not you do have friends in this life that, that dis, are described like we talked about, and I hope you do have friends or you're seeking after those friendships, if you belong to Jesus, you have a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and I hope you know him. But if you don't, I would love to talk to you right after the service and introduce you to my friend Jesus. For those of you who do, who have that friend in Jesus, who are, know him, I want to challenge you to have wise friendships. To be a wise friend to somebody else or multiple people. But when it comes to those people who you're closest with, be wise in your friendships. Friendships really do, really do make or break you. 
not just at the middle school level or the high school level, but even as adults. It matters who our friends are. And I hope you choose your friends wisely. And I hope you choose people who draw you closer to Jesus, who help you chase after Jesus, who you enjoy living life with, and who make you stronger, who challenge you and encourage you, and that you just enjoy spending life with. Because those are wise friendships.